Welcome to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel, powered by InsideTexas.com. I'm your host, Justin Wells, and we are here for a nightly post-Sugar Bowl live stream. Please, please come and join us. Like and subscribe so we can keep you up to date on everything that's going on. Um, we want to give it about 24 hours so we could all think about it and, it, it and let it process, kind of let it fester. There's a few things I've got questions about. And so I decided to bring in the two smartest guys in the world. I've got Mr. Ian Boyd. This is my main man, X's and O's guru at InsideTexas.com. I got Mr. Drew Kelson, who is not only strong and smart, but he's beautiful. And so he's got he's the total package. I'm Justin Wells from InsideTexas.com. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Guys, last night was a late one, and it was a long one, and we had waited a month. <laughs> we waited a month for that game, and obviously it didn't turn out the way Texas fans wanted. It wound up being a lot closer towards the end, but you know what? We got to go over some of this. I want to go over the offense a little bit. I want to go over the defense. I want to kind of get the vibes that you guys felt, what, what, what you saw, kind of what you felt that, that needed to be either adjusted or changed or whatnot. And, and then we'll do a little bit of looking forward to 2024 before we wrap it on up. Be sure and get in your questions. We're going to do our best to, to, to answer questions a little bit later in the show. But I'm going to, hand, I'm going to start it with, with, with Mr. Kelson. I'm going to go on that side. I'm going to go on defensive side, and then I'm going to pivot to, to Ian Boyd on the offensive side. Drew, give me your quick thoughts, and then give me kind of your defensive atmosphere and, and, and what you felt. But but first of all, give me give me kind of your 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 first impressions. Yeah, first impressions going – well, really going into this game. You know, Ian and I did a, had a conversation uh, just talking about the Washington offense versus – the Texas defense. And, and one of the things I wanted to put into context before we even started that discussion was that Michael Penix was a dog. You know, Michael Penix was the truth. He was the real deal. I've seen him play enough plays, enough snaps. It's just been too far too consistent. Uh, the second point that I think we talked about in that discussion was, you know, Ian was like, how do you stop Roma Dunze? And, and I wanted to make sure we were clear that he was not the only dog they had at receiver uh, for them. Uh, the, the other two players, Jalen Polk and Jalen McMillan, showed up as expected. Um, it wasn't just Romo Dunze. And, and this was on, I mean, the most efficient target versus reception count that, that, that you can find amongst quarterbacks and multiple receivers. So um, in that sense, from an offensive standpoint, Washington's offense I feel like things went the way I, I expected them to go, unfortunately. Um, they had bona fide players, and it really came down to can we get a couple stops and can we outscore them? And we just didn't get it done. Uh, we didn't get it done. Um, they just they, This team reminds me and reminded me the way that they efficiently execute and the way that they've consistently executed uh, in the passing game over the season and really the last two seasons, uh, they remind me of Joe Burrow's team. Um, and, and, and the way those guys were executed. I mean, it didn't matter if you 2019 had 2019 LSU squad. Yeah, man. I mean, whether you got had them covered, they can catch it. They can get behind you. They always leave you chasing. Quarterback makes a slight adjustment to the right, to the left, up in the pocket, outside the pocket, always knows where the receivers are, and just made those throws. And so uh, we were victim to that. Uh, just a perfect, perfect game by them from an offensive standpoint. Hats off to them. But, uh, yeah, there's some frustrations there, but – I mean, they, they were lights out. You just got to give credit where credit's due. Drew, it almost felt like that saying they used to have about Larry Bird. You know, you, you can t he would tell you where he was going to go, but it was a whole other thing to stop it. And I felt that way a little bit about Washington and Penix last night, who turned into a left-handed Warren Moon. I mean, he, I think he completed 13 consecutive passes in the second half. And the, the, my one big takeaway was, man, I thought the DBs played good coverage. He's just dropping them in the bucket. Ryan Watts got hit on three or four times, and I'm not sure he could have had better coverage, guys. I'm not sure he could have been could have been better at you know where he was positioned. I thought all those guys played well, but man, Penix Jr., you just got to tip your cap. That guy threw was just dropping dimes constantly, and and I thought I wish they had gotten a little bit more of a, a pass rush. I felt like that was kind of kind of like the bus there. I know that they moved him around a little bit, but like you said, he jumped around. Ian, talk to me. Give me your first impressions. You wrote a five quick thoughts last night on InsideTexas.com. Please, guys, check that out if you haven't already. 
give me kind of your kind of impressions and, 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 and talk a little bit about the Texas offense and what they did and what they didn't get to do. Well, let me just say, maybe no one else really cares about this. This is the first game that my oldest son has watched with me from beginning to end. That was a Texas game. Yeah. And uh, it That's was a little different. It was late. It was late <laughs> when that game ended. <laughs> and we both were standing up and we were both so excited for the conclusion. So uh, it was hard for me to, I just be upset. It was, it was a special moment. It was a really fun ending and it felt like Texas gave Washington all the fight they had. Um, we could, we can nitpick a lot probably on offense. Like I can give you some nitpicks in a minute, Okay, but um, it was, a, it was a really fun and satisfying game. Honestly, I think for other people, less satisfying we'll have that personal touch to it but um man it was uh it was enjoyable what a what a day of football that other game was pretty freaking awesome to watch live too and that was that's that's the local hometown team too so we got a little bit of connection there go ahead drew no i'll just it's funny because when i was watching the michigan and bama game i was like man this is who Bama has been all season. You know, yeah. Jalen Milro has pressure in his face. Uh, he's not reading the field. He's trying to use his legs. This is who Bama's been. I watched Michigan. I was like, this is who Michigan's been. And I started thinking about our game. I like, <laughs> Am I, have I been hoping that we show up and be something that we haven't been all season? Or are we going to show up and be who we've been and, you know, that be enough? Right. And I felt in certain ways, yes, we had some jitters and penalties, but – I mean, and yes, we had even the turnovers, but still just the inconsistency of execution in some ways, just couldn't get a rhythm going. We've had those spells throughout the season. So at the end of the day, I think moving beyond this game or just moving forward, it's we were who we were. I mean, we didn't show up and do anything that we weren't. It would have yeah. taken a heroic effort to, to beat them or an effort that would have shown us to be something that we haven't been. Whereas Washington showed up and they showed up just as they were too. So one thing you learn when when 30 days, when there's 30 days to play a game, a lot of times teams show up as who they are. And in and, and the perfect sense for us, yeah, if we wouldn't have had some penalties, wouldn't have had some turnovers, we definitely would have had a chance to win. But I mean, frankly, last night, if we were able to steal that one, we aren't sure who we would have been able to to say we give the credit to on our team. We it just would have been a flat out steal. So I mean, it would have been a it would have been a steal that I mean you do you would have just tipped your hat to Quinn Ewers and whoever made the winning catch, right? Yeah. I mean, I it was a it was a gamer effort. Um I I felt two contradictory things at the same time. I thought that Quinn Ewers' final throw was poorly placed. But he came up if he short. Puts that on a rope, it's a touchdown. This the timing and the placement was a little bit a little bit off. But, um, man, if you blame Quinn Ewers for that game, like, what are you doing? Right? Yeah. Like, he made so many amazing throws. And with his he feet. Felt, I think that he, was his uh, 60 yards rushing was his season high on, on the ground, too. He played his butt off. The whole team did. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the team got off schedule a lot with penalties. Yeah. If they could have run the ball more. You would, have felt, you would have felt like they would have had a chance to win the game if they could have run the ball and established the run more and kind of leaned on Washington like Wash, like uh, Michigan will try to do in a week and maybe successfully, we'll see. Um, but it doesn't feel like I, – I can nitpick on both sides of the ball, but it doesn't feel right to me to say like, oh, Texas should have won if not for the dumb coaches that didn't do X, Y, Z. Like to me, the better team won. Um, yeah. I could get into it a million, a million ways. More confident Washington, team. More confident, and, more veteran. Like and, how many and, times? And Ian, that, that's hard. That's hard for people to actually just say and admit sometimes. Like, hey, the better team won, and I don't. I'm not necessarily sure that was just the better team yesterday. I think they were just. They are the better team. That they just were. Yeah. They played like it. It, it just. Yeah. They were in control the entire time. They were just flat out the better team. And when we've convinced ourselves that, you know, how Texas could have won, yeah, those pieces that we would have collected and said, okay, yeah, if we do this, this, and this, we'd win. We didn't walk away 
yes, of course we would have done those things. We would have won. But at the end of the day, you're right. Ian. Um, yeah, we made they some assumptions confident. going into that game, but those guys are real. They were they were real. They were confident. They knew who they were. And I guess I expected Texas to be a little more of that. And I think they were to an extent. I really do. But the way I looked at it right when it went off, and, and Ian, I completely understand when they talk about your little boy watching the game with you, because mine has started to get emotionally invested in every sport now. And and, and he was there for, for every snap. And it's great because I'm negative, and he's saying, Dad, there's still time on the clock. They're only down 13. Like, he's the one that's actually apprehensive. And it's funny because it, it, it helps you go along. It, it's fun to kind of share that with them. And I basically said, look, double-digit penalties, two turnovers in the red zone going towards the goal line, big play giving up, chunk yardage, and Texas still had a shot on the last play of the game. To me, that's the resiliency of this group. I think that's what I'm going to remember the most about this 2023 team. No matter how good or bad it looked, they played so much better in the fourth quarter than they did in the previous years. They played so much more confident. And, and, and I felt bad for the for the DBs because Michael Penix was putting on a show. I felt bad that, that Byron Murphy and Devondre Sweat couldn't get more active. I felt like they were neutralized. I felt like Washington – Listen, if Washington threw the ball every snap, they may have blown Texas out in a, in a weird way. On the other flip side, if Texas runs the ball, they were averaging seven yards a carry in the first half. If Sark would have said, you know, we don't have to go vertical just yet. Let's 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 lean on them a little bit because Washington's strength is giving them the ball. So why don't we keep it out of their hands? C.J. Baxter was getting like 17 yards a clip. For the first quarter and a half. And so I'm thinking, that might be easy to do, but, you know, Sark, he's he's going to be stubborn. He wants to do what he does. Ian, uh, kind of, what are your thoughts on that? Because I felt like if they did focus more on the run, Texas may have taken Washington's offense off the clock. But at the same time, man, penalties, turnovers, chunk yardage, that's the th that's a three that's a bad threesome. I, I'm not really a fan of that argument in general. Um they could have run the ball more in the first half, but we didn't know, like in, in hindsight, it's like, just run the ball. But Texas is like, they're going to, they're going to send their tight end and their two outside receivers to the NFL in a few months. Yeah. So go with what, go with the ones that you brought. You want to, you have all these plays drawn up for them. You want to throw yeah. them the ball and see what you can do. And you know, you need points because while they may have been running for seven yards a clip, in the first half, Penix was averaging 18 yards an attempt. That's why I thought maybe take the ball out of his hands. I, but you got to score points. But yeah. here's the thing. You're right. Sark what, what, what would have leaned, yeah. Sark, yeah. Sark leaned on them in the second half, and they fumbled twice. Great point. Yep. That's they also – <clears throat> let's, let's say this for Sweat and Murphy. Murphy, Murphy and Sweat were who they've been all year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Like they could not, Washington could not run the ball. They took points off the board on, they had, there was three Washington drives that ended with either field goals or turnover on downs. Yeah. Because when they got into compressed space, they couldn't run the ball. That was they the second half, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They couldn't, they could not move the ball in compressed space against Sweat and Murphy. Murphy was in Penix's face multiple times, especially in the first half. Yes. And, and what he did just, you do? Like, like Kelson said, he just slid with the pocket. It's not just that, though. It's not just that. He had all the room in the world to get away. And why did he have all the room in the world to get away? The because, end. because those two offensive tackles for Washington are both going to get drafted. Yep. And they dominated Texas yep. in the perimeter. Yep. Dominated. Like Colin Simmons can't get to campus soon enough. Um, <laughs> Trey Moore can't get to campus soon Trey enough. Trey Moore cannot get to campus soon enough. I think Burke you, is going to be great, leave. but Burke had problems. Finkley, I think, uh, is currently inside of Rosen Garden's intestines. No offense. Mm -hmm. um, no, nobody was nobody was doing anything, yeah. and they, they even they even they even brought pressure. With Anthony Hill, yes, 
early in the game and late in the game. And uh, Washington picked it up pretty well. They, I mean, the yeah. defensive game plan did not blow me away. The pressure was not executed in a way that was – they didn't execute their pressures like Michigan, right? But they haven't done that all year. No. Well, and, you know, people want to instantly blame the safeties because they say, okay, that's that's the hole in the defense or whatever. And, and Drew, what do you – I mean, was it that much of a difference back there? And, and I say – I preface this with Sark knows they were a little soft on that back end. Sark knows that. And the reason why I know that is because in the span of three days, two weeks ago, he got a flip, five-star safety out of McKinney, Xavier Fulsame. He was going to Florida. Now he signs with Texas. So you got an elite athlete back there. Getting, you needed to add some athleticism. And then they picked up Andrew Makuba, the, the Clemson DB, out of the portal. So Sark, to me, knew that had to be – you know, there, there was a little – there was that was probably the, 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 the target back there, especially with Derek Williams missing a half. Did you see any of that, Drew, or was, was safety play basically what we had seen all year anyway? No, the safety play had – I, I mean, a lot of the longer throws that we saw that, I mean, they were just one-on-one -on -one guys. I mean, they, our corners were the ones who who were in coverage. Those great throws were made on the outside, on the sideline. Um, I mean, some of the routes and the time they had to run those routes, that, that, that part in and of itself is hard for any DB, corner or safety. If you cannot get real pressure, that kind of – makes him throw off his back foot a little bit, makes him actually lose some composure. He's yes. just doing regular bad drill, bad drills. I mean, at the end of the day, we didn't help our DBs at all. So it's very, very, very challenging for me to put pressure on DBs when we didn't do anything, and I mean anything, to consistently help them up front, cause any stress for, for Penix. And when he did get a little stressed, just who, do we, who does he throw to? He just completed it on a dime to, to his guys. They made great catches in coverage. So you just can't have one without the other. Yeah. And, and I mentioned that because you had talked about the pressure or the lack thereof. And, and so you, you want your DBs to make plays? You, you got to mess up the timing. Ian, you were going to talk. You were going to say something about it. They got four and five receivers out all the time. They could protect with five. Yeah, they, they could create space for Penix to to launch the ball, and um, they cooked the Texas cornerbacks one on one. Cooked them. Yeah. And they, 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 got, well. they got one on ones whenever they wanted, and they were, I mean, they were decently well covered. But Penix was just throwing to where his receiver had leverage. Yeah, on the right shoulder and. It wasn't like – I know it looked impressive at times, but I'm telling you, a lot of guys in the NFL – It's routine. It's yeah. a routine throw. Any NFL you, quarterback – any NFL quarterback throws for 400 last night on Texas on those looks. Yeah, but the efficiency too is just uh, – I mean, that, that's a thing. He's great. I'm not You're trying absolutely to – absolutely right. Like the, the throws are lights out for, for, for NFL, yeah. but – the receivers bringing down all of those catches in so many ways. Oh man, yeah. did they drop a ball? No, no, not, not all Justin, that. Not. Justin, they had one where like McMillan caught a screen pass that was at his ankle, and he caught it on the move, mm -hmm. and they scooped it up and, and got like a first down or something on a on their last field goal drive, I believe. And it was like okay, it looked it looked routine for them because they made everything look routine. But it was like, that could have been a dropped play. Like for most teams in the country, like 90% of teams in the country, that low and accurate throw, you're like, oh man, we almost we almost just got a first down on a bubble screen. Mm -hmm. Oh well, next play. They never had anything like that. Mm -hmm. Everything was always snagged and maximized. Mm -hmm. Including that, I want to say, I guess it was – was it McMillan that caught that touchdown in the first half off the tip ball? Yeah, yeah. That reminded me of some Oklahoma State in the late 2000s type – Rashawn Woods type catches where you just sit there and go, dang, that's going to happen tonight? Okay. You know, 
Michael Penix proved. You know what? I also thought. You know, this is I thought about this a lot. Jaden Daniels won the Heisman, and I thought right. Jaden Daniels was phenomenal. And I also thought Jaden Daniels deserved it from a number standpoint. Man, Michael Penix made me think twice because Michael Penix. Now, I don't know how much of this is going to translate to the NFL. I feel like some of it will definitely. Um, but he's got some of a, a little bit of an injury issue yeah. uh, issue as well. So I think that he's, he's got a great chance. He's got a great chance. Don't get it twisted. But I felt like Penix kind of proved, you know what, maybe I, I should have been the Heisman. I was the runner up. I'm the one playing for the national championship. I'm the one leading the Pacific Northwest to a college football national championship and all big 10 <laughs> in two years. I mean, imagine even thinking that. So I, I was just blown away by Penix. Like, I, we knew he was good. We saw him last year. I don't think we expected him to be this perfect. And, may, and, and Drew had mentioned, hey, I was afraid this was going to happen. Ian, you had talked about, hey, they know what they're doing. He's throwing it to their leverage. He's throwing it to only where they get it or nobody gets it. And I, I think you got to give the coaching staff and those guys a ton of credit. Um, what's your final thoughts from the Sugar Bowl? Like, now that you've got 24 hours to process everything, and now you're done, and now it's 2024. For, for guys like us, it's 2025 recruiting class. For you guys, it's 2024. Spring ball is a month away. You know, what's kind of your, your takeaways from, from, from what we saw last night? And then moving forward, what do, what, how's, this, how's this group going to go? Because is the trajectory still going to go up? You're going to have a lot of guys coming back. You're going to lose a lot of guys. I want both of y'all's takes on this. Ian, you go first. Um, I feel a little silly for thinking that Texas was maybe the front runner in the tournament because mm. everything that came up that was that took them down was like, yeah, okay, that makes sense, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, some things that were like kind of overlooked by certainly by me, I think by Texas fans in general, Texas was just a little too young in the back seven. Um, Sweat and Murphy carried this team all year on defense and made them look awesome. Um, a, their schedule made them look a little better than they are on defense. Yeah. Um, they started in this game – I mean, Ryan Watts played a lot, but they were honestly better with Watts on the bench for Brooks and, and Muhammad. And when those two were out there, when their best five were out there in the secondary with Derek Williams and Malik Muhammad, it was like freshman, sophomore, senior, redshirt, sophomore, freshman. Yeah. And that's just not winning playoff football roster makeup. Especially against an offense like they were facing. Especially against – but that's what you that's what you got to beat in the playoffs. That's what you get up against in the playoffs is you get up against these teams that are extraordinary for whatever reason, right? Yeah. Anthony Hill was frozen up in coverage. Anthony Hill is not a precise blitzer yet. He's a true freshman. Right. And he is that kid is so much better than I thought he would be this year as a freshman at that position. A very demanding position mentally as Drew could tell us. He was a lot better than I thought he would be. He wasn't. He wasn't ready for. He wasn't ready for last night. He wasn't yeah. ready for that. They were. They were young. Um, the edges. They're just not there on the edges yet. They got swallowed. solid, but not spectacular. Solid, but not spectacular. Which is fine. You can win a Big Twelve that way, but you can't win a national championship. Good point. Yeah, Ian. I mean, Ian used to do his breakdown on the Space Force. Every week, we don't get those anymore. But at the end of the day, should have listened to myself, right? <laughs> you listen to yourself, Ian. You know, no matter how good Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat are, no matter how dominant they are in the middle, you need edges, right? And if you have edges, and the other, or if you don't have edges, and the other team has elite tackles, what does that do? This is the Ian Boyd formula, right? <laughs> Same thing out out wide. When you have receivers and DBs, where do the matches where are the matchups lie? And Washington was the epitome of what you would consider typically in just a matchup nightmare for for anyone, just because of the way they can attack in space, the way that they can protect their quarterback, and their quarterbacks throwing everything on the dime. So <laughs> my, my my takeaway just on the Sugar Bowl in general, it's hey. 
Texas, we, we, we hit, I mean, we achieved our ceiling this year. You know, it's like, what's the ceiling for this team? Yes. Could we have won this game if things had played out differently and had a chance and actually won the national championship? Absolutely. But we're also one of a few teams, one of eight maybe or so teams that on the right day, when we put everything together, we have an opportunity to win. Uh, yeah. We didn't do that yesterday. But as far as I'm concerned, we, 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 we achieved our ceiling. Uh, I mean, the, the main thing I'm thinking about, and, and I'm very proud of this team and the way that they went about it and the, the standard that was set for the culture. Um, we can talk about this 2023 team, but I'm thinking more so from the standpoint of what this program looks like, uh, what has been done over the last three years, and where is this program at currently? You know, where's the floor set? Um, I think the thing that, and I'll probably make this point, can make this point in a little more detail later, but I think the thing that stands out to me the most regarding the Sugar Bowl, this game, um, and just everything bringing it up to these three years is that these guys have all said that they bought in. They've all worked their tails off. They've all did everything. They thought they were doing everything possibly right and putting everything, their heart and soul, into this. And they still fell short. So when they go into this offseason – you can say you're putting your heart and soul again into it. You can say you're working hard. I think we've set a new floor for what hard work looks like. There you go. So that should be the expectation of what hard work looks like. Yeah. But then you have to pivot to, but what didn't we do well? So you make sure that you keep your floor high, but then you level up to what is next. Getting rid of penalties, yes. uh, being disciplined on your edges, being disciplined in, in your in your reads uh, as, as a DB and in your coverage and in your, in your details of your techniques. Um, so you're not giving receivers free releases. Uh, maybe we do, and one thing that I appreciate about Sark is they do a really honest self-eval, at least they have in the last couple of years at the end of the season. Yeah. And hopefully they do that again and, and may spend some time on, on some other defensive coverages, on other details that help elevate and bring us to the next level because – you can bust your tail and put all of this energy into everything yeah. and still fall short. So you know not an ounce of energy less is going to be enough moving forward. And that's what I'm most excited about because the standard has been set on what it takes to win. And the guys know they can't show up and do anything less if they expect to, to make it back to the college football playoff. I love that. I love that point. And, and I love it because you got the most out of your Tavondre sweat. You're, you're, you're over your you're guys that carried over your Byron Murphy, you know, uh, your, your Jaron Thompson, your, your Jatavian Sanders, your Christian Jones. You, you got the your Xavier Worthy. You got the most out of those guys. And what people need to understand is these young cats that are coming in this freshman class last year in this new freshman class, they're going to have 17 early enrollees on campus in two weeks. To me, that's how it carries over. Because I think those freshmen are so talented from last year. I mean, they played so much. We, we, we saw that. And so – and you talk about a group with confidence. That young group, those pups, they play big, man. They are not too big for the moment. You can tell the ones that played for the state championship, played those big 5A, 6A games in the playoffs. They're built for it. And I think, Quinn, you could even put him in that category. I do want to ask this because I, I really, really want to hear what you guys think about this. And I'm going to go back to Drew on this. More than likely, Quinn Ewers is returning. That that's that's pretty much known that he's going to return. Arch Manning will be the backup, and they'll and they'll move that they'll move forward in the spring. What else does Quinn have to do with his game to to to, to get to that next level? Yeah, you can do this, this, and this, and hit your ceiling and win the Big Twelve. But like Ian said, once you get in the playoff, you got to take it up a notch. You got there's certain things you have to do to go further. What does Quinn Ewers in, in this offense have to do more so in 2024? Honestly, if, if you take a step back, like, okay, Quinn, just focusing on you, what do you need to do? I, I do think there's some things that he'll, he'll want to do physically, which is why he wants to come back. Um, ultimately, I mean, you can say, well, Quinn has had the best batch of receivers he, he, he's had. I mean, he can't imagine having the guys come in and replace this. But I, I'll say this. I think the most important thing is for him to get chemistry with whoever his next crop of guys are going to be. Yes. And do that as soon as possible. I mean, that's his most important job right now, both for this team and both for the future, his NFL future. Um, 
Quinn, regardless of who the narrative or who's saying, who, who's, who's speaking, Quinn has done enough to be a leader. He's done enough to execute an offensive game plan. But there's still a ton of this that people are giving Sark more of the credit than I think people are really trusting that Quinn is the guy that's actually driving us. Yeah. So I'm anxious to see how he takes that next step as a leader and as a guy on this team who, when they look at Texas football next year and we're winning games or we're performing, there's no Tavondre Sweat and, and, and Byron Murphy at, being at the headline. There's no Jaden Jalen Ford. There's no Xavier Worthy and, and Adonai Mitchell. At the right. end of the day, this is certainly Quinn's, Quinn's team this coming year. Um, he took those strides this year, but the guys are going to have to rally around him. He's going to have to build chemistry. He's going to have to set the expectation with his gut, within him, within his heart, within his soul, on what it feels like and what it looks like to treat every day between now and the kickoff of next season like there's nothing more important to him. Now is when it starts. It starts right now. It starts right now. He has to be hurt. He has to be sick. He has to be hungry. And it starts right now and not a second later. Somebody asked this on the board. I wish I could remember the who it was specifically. But they're like, they asked essentially this question, like, what does it look like for Quinn to take another step? And uh, <clears throat> it just occurred to me that the right answer is really like for him to do consistently what Penix did in this game, which is to be trusted to go – and dominate a game with four and five receivers in pattern on majority of your snaps and you navigate playing behind five man protection. Yeah. And you go out and you know where the one-on-one -on -one is and you throw the ball where your guy can make a play. Like that is essentially like the highest level of college quarterback. Yeah. Sort of NFL quarterback as well. Yeah. Um, I, I would say it has been more Sark than Quinn to this point. I mean, he makes the plays, so it's not all Sark. Right, right. But uh, he's seen Sark in his bag this year, and I think it's because he's got Quinn at the right spot and everybody kind of clicking. Right, right. But there's like, there's like, a, there's different levels of mastery. There's like the level of mastery where you can serve as a really effective joystick for your offensive coordinator. And then there's, like, like a Mac Jones field general where you're calling the shots, you know? Um, and Penix, Penix was actually there. Like he could go out there and just. There was a reason like, he was in New York city that first weekend in December. Yeah. He knew how, he could go out there and know what to do. And he didn't need DeBoer to pre, pre It was already there. Uh, he didn't need DeBoer's like careful play call instruction. Right. Tell he just exactly. needed grip it and rip it mentality. Yeah. Uh, they that's what they're gonna do. <laughs> that's the next step. That's the next step for yours. And he honestly, he showed flashes of it, um, especially in those like two minute drives before the half. Yes. To tie, to tie the game before the half, that was a, quite a drive. And um, the two drives to uh, uh, put the game within, you know, an inch. Like those were not plays where Sark had him on a joystick necessarily. Like Quinn had to go out there and kind of do some things for himself a little bit. Ownership. He was taking some of that ownership. He he was he was dealing at times. And he you threw know, some really nice balls. So uh yeah, I, I think he could get there next year. He he will need them to restock the receiver room. Like Penix isn't Penix without McMillan and Adunze. And Rome and Jalen Polk. I mean, Jalen yeah, Polk is the best number three receiver in college oh. football, and it's not even close. And can you imagine Texas Tech didn't want him? This, I, don't I, mean, know. I don't even – Matt Wells, we share the same last name, and now I'm ashamed because it's like, what are you talking about? That kid could ball in high school. Jaron Thompson and Jalen Polk were really good friends. I covered those kids since they were freshmen. Yeah. No were ballers in high school. Jalen Polk can play basketball. These were some dudes, and Polk has got to be the best three receiver I've seen in a long time. You know, Drew made a good point, and this, and and, I'll, and we'll wrap it up on on Quinn, and we'll go over to the defense because I think we got a little bit more to talk about to replace on the defensive side. But you made the point, and, and I kind of it, you talked about 
These were the best receivers Quinn Ewers has had. And so it kind of reminds me of Vince Young's first year when he had a veteran Roy Williams and B.J. Johnson and Sloan Thomas and, and Bo Scaife tied in. They, they helped Vince, obviously, over that maturation. But Vince's best year were his worst receivers. Yep. Think about it. And, and yep. I'm not knocking Quan Cosby. I'm not knocking Lima Swede, uh, you know, Brian Carter, any of those guys. But Vince had – the guys his first year or two, and then he had to grow with these next ones. So I'm, I'm curious who's going to step up in that room. Cause you're going to have Quinn's going to get better. He's going to continue to improve. We saw that from the last year, a big, big chunk. Now it reminds me of Vince. Quinn's going to lose a lot of those big receivers. He's going to lose a lot of those guys to the league. And now he's got to start getting on the same page with the Jonte cooks, the Ryan Wingos, the Deandre Moores, and of course, Matthew golden. And so I, Man, it, it 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 it's 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 unique, but it's also we've seen it done before. I guess. Well, I'd say. It, it doesn't. So so th- there there's context for that too. Yes, uh, and I think this is probably two of the key things. Is yes, getting in sync with these new receivers is going to be key. But one thing we had uncertainty about going into this season, and then we discovered it later, and probably a little later, and we even resisted it until we just we really leaned on it. But I think next year we're going to know we have it, and it's going to help. Quinn a bit more is the running back. Running the ball. If we can run the ball effectively to the point where we go into the game knowing we're going to run the ball and really anchor ourselves to running the ball with our talented backs, experienced O-line, and find spots and places where Quinn can just distribute to ball, the ball to some younger, newer receivers finally getting reps a bit more. I think that's really where, where we pivot next year. And we see yeah. Quinn have that efficiency because he'll have his spots in the run game. If we can threaten people in the – he'll have his spots in the passing game if we can commit to effectively testing people in the run game, making them respect the run. And I feel like last year with Bijan and Rowe, they respected the run, and it did open some things up for Quinn. Yes. But he was less mature then. This year we were so far ahead from a receiver standpoint – and uncertain with, with the running back room, it was almost like we, we had to get the ball to these guys because they were the best, most, you know, they, they were making plays. JT Sanders, I mean, all these guys were making plays. I do think we won't have as much uncertainty going into next year. So all of our game planning should be, I hope, really be around anchoring, a- anchoring the run game, leaning on the run game, um, having teams show that they're committed to stopping the run game and yes. allowing Quinn to pick up and pick apart uh, things with some of these more inexperienced receivers that are still going to be gamers, but they get to work their way into the mix. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Ian, defense. They're losing some guys, man. And and last year they lost some guys. Last year we saw Texas kind of jump back in the NFL draft. You know, half a dozen guys get drafted. You lose Overshone. We worried about would they replace that hyper, you know, Uber athletic type. They, they lost Keandre Coburn and, and Moro Ajomo, and you wondered, were they going to be able to replace that, you know, in the interior? They're going to have to reload again. Now they're going to have to replace some more D linemen, two of your – essentially the three best defensive players, two of them were the, your defensive tackles. The other one, obviously, Jade Barron, in my opinion. And so what's the defense going to look like, Ian, next year? What, what, what are they going to – I think they'll be better out on the edge, actually. I think they'll be – I think they'll probably take a step back at linebacker, and I think the secondary is going to be better. And so, in your eyes, synthesize. Well, it's going to be hard to be as – quite as, like, effortlessly dominant next year. Yeah, like especially if, stopping the run. If you can't just, like, dominate teams in the A and B gaps before a play even starts, then you got to do things the hard way, basically. But – um I think there is an advantage like Washington this year. Washington always seemed to make enough plays to win on defense all year. Yep. Like they're they're 14 and 0 now. And their defensive tackles are pretty good actually. But a lot of it was they had so many veteran upperclassmen in the back seven. Yes. They could just make winning plays when they had to. You know? And Texas had this year, they had like uh, like three or four guys like that, honestly, out of 
seven or eight. Yeah. Like um, Ford was like that. They're going to miss him. Um, Taff is actually kind of like that. Watts at times, although he was, you know, cooked last night. They need a they, – they have a lot of ways that they can get – they can get marginally better at a dozen – at a dozen spots just by getting a year older at okay. yeah. a position like uh, Derek Williams. That kid can be so much better. I don't think he leaves the field for the next two years. And that I guy, do think it will only be two more years. That guy makes so many plays right now, just because of athleticism and range. Yeah. Like he barely knows what he's doing. Taff actually has another gear. I think. No, he does. Like, Richard he's sophomore. He does. He's Same grade as Quinn. Or no, he's a year older than Quinn. I'm sorry. Such an instinctual player. Or, I mean, just I mean, he's smart, obviously. Um, don't give up on Terrence Brooks. The dude is only a true sophomore this year. Terrence Brooks is one of the best players on the defense, in my opinion. I think he's got some of the most he doesn't have Malik Muhammad's stickiness or or you know that wingspan that Manny's got, but T B's been bred to play D B. You know, Mr. Chet Brooks, his father, he that kid came out the womb playing DB, doing a backpedal. I think Terrence Brooks has as much upside as any of them. He's He's got more. He's got more that we haven't seen yet. Anthony Hill has barely figured out football um, at this level. I mean, there's like a – and then the edges too. There's a lot of ways that this team can get a lot better. There was actually times – this was mostly a function of the matchup where stopping the run mattered less than pass rush. But there were times when Texas was a little bit better when they had Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton on the field. Over you had like an old school strong side defensive end and like an Alfred Collins. Over Sweat and Mur- even a tackle. Because, in the interior, yeah. Because Collins and Broughton are a different level of athlete as pass rushers than uh, Sweat and Murphy. Like that, that might get a little pushback. I don't know. We'll see. Well, no, no, no. I mean, those weren't Murphy and Sweat will never be, you know, mi- you know, misunderstood as pass rushers. They were just monsters. They just hit people in their way. Whereas yeah. Alfred and Vernon are long. Those guys, you know, those are multiple sport guys, honestly. Yeah, and so, and, and we, saw Bur- we saw Broughton have a, a, you know, come up this year. We saw Alfred Collins at times. Drew, who is, tell me two guys that it's like, look, if the 2024 defense is going to be like it, it was last year, these two or three guys, it's their turn. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, maybe a little bit. You're still muted too, Drew. You're muted. It's all yeah, good. Muted. Sorry about that. My, 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 my little one came in here. Um, <laughs> we, we've, um, I feel we should have the guys at corner and, and at safety, meaning when, when we – I feel like we have the guys who will develop at those positions. Yes. Corners. Safety be honest, yes. But to be honest with you, I don't know if we have an edge yet. I, I really don't know. I don't know if we have a guy, we have recruits. We have guys who need to be developed. I can't tell you there's anyone who's going to, that we know is going to step up and be that edge, be that DT, be that disruptor that that's going to get pressure. And so I'm, um, Frankly, going into next season, I feel like we may have more pressure on our DBs, um, but they're ta- they're talented and skilled. Right. Um, but I, we're going to need I, – I don't know what – you know, you talk about what is Quinn's next step of development. Right. I don't know where Baron Sorrell's next step is. I don't know if he's going to be as disruptive. I don't know if – if can we get more out of Ethan Burke? Um, who is going to step up as a pass rusher? who can play more run pass run downs as well and not be a liability, but get after the quarterback. That's the unknown. So when I, when I look at this game, we just played um, my biggest concern in this game was, was time of possession. And can we keep them off the field? They had, I think five, four or five possessions that were all over four minutes. I mean, these guys, they're not, they didn't have to rush. They didn't have to hurry up. They didn't have to do anything. They just they go up. For the second half, they didn't snap the ball over to over 10 seconds. Dude, they are patient, confident. They will make you sweat because they drive the ball down the field methodically. It doesn't matter if you're running or passing. If you can control the clock and control the ball and consistently execute down the field. Mind you, they were, what, three of 11 or three of six? Like, 
they weren't great on third down. Third downs, neither one. Yeah, so neither team. They still had that time of possession in spite of not being great on third down. So I said all that to say, if you have to ask me what a formula is for winning next year and how do we protect our defense until we find those edge rushers, until we figure out who's going to fill in these gaps, mm-hmm. I do think running game, your offense has to protect your defense. I don't think that's any secret going into next year as far as the way we understand the the team will be constructed now. Uh, hopefully we are, and I'm not saying it has to be as pass heavy as Washington did it, right. but, we de- but we definitely going to need our offense to protect our defense based on just all of the unknowns we have on defense going into next season. Absolutely. And, 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 and you know, a lot of our commenters are, are nailing this. Trey Moore, UTSA, listen, I, I, I think it translates to the next level. I think this guy can be productive in the SEC. 35 and a half tackles for loss over the last two years, 22 sacks over the last two years. Uh, you know, talked to a couple of UTSA staffers a couple of weeks ago who told me Trey Moore is actually a better person and a harder worker than he is a football player. I mean, this is a kid that had no stars coming out of high school. And, and Jeff Trailer and those guys really developed him. And so you'd like to see Trey Moore be able to hopefully slide in and, and take on some of that as well. Do you think, Justin, that he could learn inside linebacker? I don't know if that's the I don't know if that's really the plan anyway, but I think he could. I think he might be a little light in the britches, but I think he could. Yes, I think he could. We know that Anthony Hill is more likely, is most likely going to Mike in the spring. He's going to take over Jalen Ford's spot in the middle. Okay. And so there's going to have to be somebody there at will, whether it be Maurice Blackwell, Leo, I mean Leon LaFowle. I mean, I mean, you there's going to have to be somebody who's going to have to step up there. David Benda, does he come back? Does he go to Nevada with Jeff Cho? I mean, that's something that's going to have to be answered. So I think he's a little light, but I think he could play it. So um, three big portal guys. You know, Sark's been very judicious when it comes to taking guys in the transfer portal. Three guys. I want you two to tell me which one's the most important. Ian gets to go first. Matthew Golden. And this is about need, too. Matthew Golden, Andrew Makuba, or Trey Moore. Who is going to be the most needed? Well, wide receivers dominate the modern game. So Golden is definitely the right answer. Um, they need they need him to be a star. The reason that Texas won the Big 12 and went to the playoffs is because they had Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy. And uh, they will not have either of them next year. Golden needs to replace one of them, essentially. Makuba is super important. Like I, I, I've heard some people talk like, well, you know, Texas is going to get better. They have Makuba next year. They need Makuba just to have a chance at treading water at star because they lose Jade Barron. Yeah. Um, I, I think that guy could be very, very good. I, I hate to. Uh, you you can his- make an argument. All three are equally important. Well, you, you could, but I, it's golden. It's golden. <laughs> he needs to be a star. That they need that so bad. Yeah, you're right. You're right. All right, Kelson. What I, do you think? I'm I'm sorry. I I can't help, but I can't think of the last time we had a dominant edge. So it's it's hard for me to just pass up. And he Trey was Moore. defensive end. I don't know if Trey Moore's gonna be that guy, but we absolutely. Oh, Miguel Gonzalez. I'm seeing a few people with comments here. We need we need pressure. We absolutely need pressure. I think we got it this year from the middle of our defense, whereas they were so disruptive. Sometimes it flushed to our edges and they had yeah. other opportunities and teams. We just overwhelmed teams, but we, we need an edge rusher. And I'm not saying I, I think Matt Golden's going to be great, uh, but I think with all the talent we have coming in early, um, some of the talent we already have on campus, I'm not saying we have guys that are already Matt Golden. We definitely have guys with that production coming back. What we do have are guys we know we can get something out of. Uh, With an experienced O-line and with experienced quarterback and experienced running backs, I'm confident we'll find what we need at receiver and hopefully have a bit more balance. I I can't get past, and this maybe maybe it's just recency bias, but the need for edge pressure – we, we need one. We, we need somebody great and, and kind of beyond the specialized packages of having Anthony Hill supplement to come in and come off the edge and have Mo Blackwell and Jade Barron. We, we need a guy who we can, we can line up with four pass rushers, four guys rushing on a known passing down, 
get some pressure, cause some disruption, make them have a quick throw, take away the hot reads. We need somebody who can who can put a quality right or left tackle on skates. Uh, we, we need it bad. You know, Trey Moore's my guess. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it, you know, look at the NFL draft. What's the number one priority in all NFL franchises? Get a quarterback. What's the number two priority? Get a guy that can get to the quarterback. For every C.J. Stroud, the next draft pick is a Will Anderson. For mm-hmm. every Bryce Young, the next pick seems to be a Dallas Turner or, or you know, somebody of that sort. It's that – it's that important these, this day and age. It's that important. Just real quick, everybody, thank you for listening. We still got a few more minutes. We're going to go. I'll please, please like and subscribe and come see us at InsideTexas.com. It is really is a great community. We have a great time. We had an amazing 2023 season. I wake up with an immense sense of gratitude every time I get to talk to these guys and I get to do this for a living. So please like and subscribe and come hang out with us at InsideTexas.com. We've got a special going right now. You get a, a, a dollar for a month. Come give us a try because we've got the second window of the National Signing Day, but we're really jumping into 2025's recruiting class. we got a junior day in late January that we're covering as well. Here's my last question for you two guys, and then, and then I'll spit one out uh, at, at the end. Um, what's going to be the one thing you remember the most about this year? Because to me, this was I had more joy covering this team than I have since I've done this. And, and you could say, well, yeah, they, they had this run. Well, you know what? 2018 was fun, too. That Sugar Bowl run, that beating Georgia, Bevo almost goring me to get to the dog. Those were, that, was, that was a great year. Chris Boyd, Charles Amenahu had strong senior seasons. Ellinger kind of came out of his shell. There have been some good years, but 2023 to me is probably my favorite that I've covered. If there's one thing that you're going to take with you, what's it going to be about this year? Drew, you want to go first? For, for me, it, it, it has to be just the, the – the, the, yes, we won the Big 12 championship, and yes, this we're going to the SEC. There's a collection of stories here that just stand out for me, and I really – it's just uh, – I'm not going to use the phrase um, we're back in any sense, but <laughs> what stands out to me is I feel like our culture, our coach – um, we can cheer for this team, but I feel like I have a program I'm proud to cheer for. Um, this team this year has marked that. And it had far less to do with making it to the college football playoff because, you know, that, that could have been out of our control. That could have done a different way. Absolutely. Uh, the way these guys showed up and played uh, every game, the way that they set out to achieve a goal. They set out to win the Big 12 championship. They set out to have a revenge tour. They wanted to go out. They worked for it. They committed to it. Um, this just marked this season marked a turn and page from a cultural and a program perspective at a time that I think is critical uh, for us. And so we got to not just hear Sark and the players talk about culture and hard work and the things that matter to them. We really got to go along for that ride with them each and every week, uh, both from the stress standpoint and from the accomplishment and achievement standpoint. And, and that's what stands out to me, uh, the, the, the group of guys on this team that helped anchor this culture that I think is going to set the floor for, for what um, just just for what we get to experience as a fan base and as supporters moving forward. Um, so th- that, that's what stands out for me. I think we turned a corner this year, something we've been long, long, long been waiting for. So I'm excited about it. Follow that, Ian. I don't know how, but try. I agree with all that. I wish they'd beaten OU, though. <laughs> they probably would be the number one seed in the playoff and maybe have to have a rematch that. with Bama if they would have I don't care about that I'll trade the Bama win and the playoff berth for if they could have just beaten Oklahoma yeah would have been a little man scary. this yeah, might yeah. be the first and only year I disagree with that to me the big beating Bama yeah, exactly. in Bama by double digits something's never happened to Saban before I, I, I can't cool. not think about that. Like I, that to me, it was like Joe Burrow when they asked him in 2019, you know, Drew had brought this up earlier and I started thinking about that team. They asked him, when did y'all know y'all were going to make a run? He said, as soon as we got in the locker room after the Texas win. And I think that Alabama win galvanized things. I think everyone thought, all right, the buy-in is legit. We can actually do this. And so for me, I will 99 times out of hundred, I'm going to agree with Ian. I was like, man, get the Oklahoma win. You, you keep your job at Texas by beating Oklahoma. Get that OU win. But, man, the way to go in 
to, to Tuscaloosa and do the way they did it to run the ball the last eight minutes of a game that was that was... against that front in that atmosphere, I thought we saw the team sort of become who they were going to be. We started seeing, seeing the, the beginning of that, and to me, I, that was so cool. As important as that was, that Big 12 championship made sure that it was validated. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah. that, that game was – that game was, I mean, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Like to flip, like Texas coming back by handing Alabama their first home loss non conference since 2007. There was a lot of like, I don't know how else to say it. There's like a lot of spiritual, symbolic power in Texas going on the road and winning in Tuscaloosa yeah. and kind of reversing a decade of, of wrongs, so to speak, right? That's what it felt well, like. You're probably right. You're probably right. But it would have been nice. It would have been nice if they could have if they could have beat the Sooners. Oh yeah. I mean, and the the part that that kills me, and we'll we'll end with this. I mean, they were the the defensive series, the last defensive series of that game still kills me. There were two plays, three plays where if they're in the right position. Gabriel doesn't get those yardage. He doesn't get those passes off. Texas gets the ball back. They probably kick a field goal. They probably win. I'm more upset at the OU loss because of not that they got beat. It's because there were so many little bitty details in that last five minutes of that game that would have changed it, that would have given Texas the W. But most of the time, you're not going to hear me argue about an OU win. But, Justin, one thing I love about this staff is, is that the standard has been set, though. Everything over the next few weeks, all of us who – who, who love this sport, but also who love this team, we're going to all have our opinions on what the glaring needs were going, you know, going into the off season, uh, what's, what's needed going into next year, where we need to, to, to clean things up, where we need to get better. And I'm not saying we're going to get better in these areas next year. What I am saying is I, I'm confident Sark, won't, it won't be lost on Sark. I know yeah. last year our concerns were third down defense, red zone defense. Um, we've gotten that addressed. Early on in the tenure with Sark and this staff, it was it was tackling. It was defense in general. Uh, can Sark handle the other side of the ball and get the other side of the ball right? Can we complimentary ball? Complimentary ball. So every offseason, I felt we do fair assessments of who we are, what we need to improve on. Um, and there's some things that during the season, you just don't have the time or the guys to 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 make the adjustments necessary. And, and this is coming off a team that, that made a ton of adjustments. Uh, throughout this year um, with, with guys getting hurt and, and having to, to play on their toes. So that's the silver lining there for me. It's, it's, I mean, we're going to have to see Jeff Levy again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Some of these coaches, we're going to have to see them. Uh, we're going to have to see him in Starkville. Uh, there's certain things we're going to have to see people again. So uh, for me, it's just, I'm, I'm happy about this year and that I feel confident we have a staff that's going to look at this film, uh, be pissed about it. And go back and fix and focus and, and and emphasize the things that they need to be taken care of, so that we can make the plays and do the small things when it matters most uh, next season. You, you nailed it. The, the 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 accountability is established. The meritocracy. There's a line there, and you're either in it on the right side or you're on the wrong side. And I think Sark has has done that. It went from a coach led team to a player led team. And to me, that was probably the, the biggest difference. Any parting shots, shots, Mr. Boyd? No. Glad they won the Big 12 championship. That, that I am a, too. That was a sweet, that was a sweet victory. That was an important thing. Um, season six, 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 a success because of that. The last year in the Big 12, they took care of business. They couldn't beat OU, but they're bringing them to the SEC with them. Everyone else was a kill shot. They'll get to the playoffs again. It's about to get easier, sort of. It, yeah, in a, in a weird, in a weird, weird way. Gentlemen, thank you so much for for coming on and hanging out with me tonight. I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of the Inside Texas YouTube channel. Uh, we, we, we're going to continue to bring you the, the best content possible on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. Like I said, January is about to we're, – we're starting over the calendar. Recruiting 2025 is amping up. We got Junior Day on January 20th. Uh, Inside Texas will be in Austin for it, so be, be able to, to pay attention to that. Final thing, who wins between Michigan and Washington, and then we'll get out of here. 
Sure. I, I mean, I, I have Washington. Uh, I'm already pegged as this is the Joe Burrow elite receiver squad. Yeah. Um, last week I said it. That was kind of my big concern is <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. These guys are different. Um, so I, I think Washington's defense is, is good enough to, to, to stop what Michigan or slow down what Michigan does well, but they have to outscore them. So I got to hear Ian's because Ian <laughs> has become partly a Michigan man. He's become partly now. He may not. He may remove himself here in the future, but he's still got some Michigan. It's wore off on him. So I gotta. I, I want to know what Ian thinks. I'm not sure. <laughs> Bull, you're sure about everything. I'm not. You're the I'm most. Not, you think you're the most thought provoking person possible. I, you think out I, every answer you ever say. What are you talking? I know. About? I haven't thought this one out enough. I mean, I think Drew might be right. I. I I want to lean that way, but I'm just not totally sure. Washington's formula works. And, and they I don't have, have to run the ball. See, they don't have to run the ball. And that's Michigan's they, strength they, on defense. They eat, up the clock. It, they eat up the clock. If Michigan can consistently execute long drives and keep the clock away from Washington, I really <laughs> think that is how you put them on edge, is being able to control the clock uh, because – if, if Michigan's doing three and outs and punting, I'm, I understand they have a great D line, but yeah. Caleb they're gonna run the ball, is, though. They're going to come is, out and run the ball. It, they should. They absolutely they should. should. Texas, they absolutely Texas should. did it in the first half and did it really they absolutely well. Absolutely should. They should. They should. Blake Michigan Corn is should a have lot a, better at it than Texas. No, they 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 absolutely are. Yeah, I think their D line and their edges will put more pressure. Yeah, I just I'm telling you, I've seen. People and Michael Penix has continued to say, like, they keep underestimating us. They keep underestimating us. I've seen enough these last 30 days. I watched more Washington than I wanted to watch. And I'm telling you, they're just different. Um, they're not going to, <laughs> this is not Jalen Milrow that they're playing against no. uh, next week. It's just not. Penix said it best. He said it best. They wrote us off, but I never wrote back. I never wrote back. And you know what? We got to tip our caps. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Come see us at InsideTexas.com. Like, subscribe. Be sure to pay it. Pay attention to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. We'll be continuing to do shows. Ian Boyd, thank you so much, my brother. Appreciate you. Drew Kelson, nothing but love, my man. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, come see us again at InsideTexas.com. Hook them. Well.